Today, Wednesday of the first week of Lent, we come to one of my favorite churches in all of Rome, Santa Maria Maggiore. According to legend, a wealthy Roman had a dream on August 4th in the year 352, in which he was directed by Mary to construct a basilica on a site which she herself would reveal to him. The following night, a snowfall took place on the Esquiline Hill, a truly miraculous event for the month of August in Rome. And the Pope at the time, Pope Liberius, initiated the construction of the first basilica, which stood in a location about one block in front of the present one. Although it's unclear if this first basilica was dedicated to the Blessed Virgin from the beginning, the definition of Our Lady as Mother of God at the Council of Ephesus in the year 431 brought about a new flowering of devotion to her. In this atmosphere, Pope Sixtus III began to build a new basilica in her honor, in a location slightly behind this first one. It is this building that, with modifications, comes down to the present day. The basilica began to be known as St. Mary Major, as a principal church in Rome dedicated to Our Lady in the 7th century, the same period in which the relics held to be from the manger of Christ at Bethlehem were enshrined here. Various minor changes took place over the next few centuries. In the 9th century, it's of note that Hadrian II, the Pope at the time, approved Saints Cyril and Methodius's translation of the liturgy into Slavonic in this church. Standing in the square before the basilica today, a couple of things draw our interest before we enter the church itself. The first of these is the Marian column in the center of the square. The column is originally from the Basilica of Maxentius in the Roman Forum. This is the inspiration for the many Marian columns which can be found throughout Rome and in other cities of Europe. And the second point of interest are the mosaics of the old facade of the basilica, currently protected behind the columns of the 18th century loggia. They depict Christ attended by angels in the heavenly liturgy and scenes from the legend of the basilica's foundation. As we leave the busy square for the peaceful interior of the basilica, a wealth of decoration greets us. The ceiling has a story to tell us. It's said that it's decorated with the first gold brought back from the New World by Columbus. It's believed that the explorer gave the treasure to the Spanish monarchs Ferdinand and Isabella, who in turn gave it to the Spanish Pope Alexander VI, who used it in his renovation of the basilica. Moving to the right inside the church, we find the Blessed Sacrament Chapel. The large tabernacle, shaped like a small church and held aloft by four angels, is a good example of one of the forms that tabernacles took in the Counter-Reformation era. Below this is a previous location of the chapel in which were kept the relics of the manger of Christ. To the left of this is a tomb of St. Pius V, the Pope to whom we owe much of the implementation of the Council of Trent. Across the chapel is a tomb of his successor, Sixtus V, responsible for many architectural works in the city, among them Piazza del Popolo and the completion of the cupola of St. Peter's Basilica. As we go back into the nave to stand before the high altar, we pass the tomb of the Bernini family on the right, set into the steps of the sanctuary, in which lie the mortal remains of John Lorenzo Bernini. One of the most prolific architects of the Baroque period, he is perhaps best known as the designer of the Saborium and Colonnade of St. Peter's.
were now in front of the great ciborium, standing over the high altar, which reuses four columns from its medieval predecessor. Within the altar lies the relics of St. Matthew, St. Matthias, and several other martyrs. The Confessio below us holds the chapel ad precepte of the manger, in which is a reliquary said to hold pieces of wood from the manger in which our Lord was placed in Bethlehem. This chapel in particular is a station for the Mass at night for Christmas, making it unique as the only station at a specific chapel of a church. St. Ignatius of Loyola, a supporter of the station church devotion, said his first Mass before these relics in a previous location of this chapel on Christmas Eve in the year 1538. Although he had hoped to celebrate his first Mass in the Holy Land, faced with the impossibility of fulfilling that desire, he elected to say it in this basilica, which preserves a little bit of Bethlehem in the center of Rome. The artistic highlights of the basilica are the magnificent mosaics on the triumphal arch from the original church in the fifth century. And in the apse from the late 13th century edition, the arch depicts the two cities, Jerusalem and Bethlehem representing the churches from the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews obviously identified with Jerusalem, and the Gentiles were connected with Bethlehem because it was there that the Savior was first manifested to them in the Magi. The apse is dominated by an image of the coronation of the Virgin with scenes from the life of Our Lady below, showing the Annunciation, the Nativity, the Dormition, the Adoration of the Magi, in the presentation. Now moving on the left aisle, we arrive at the Chapel of the Blessed Virgin, also known as the Pauline or Borghese Chapel, from its builder Paul V Borghese. Its centerpiece is the ancient icon of Our Lady, Salus Populi Romani, Salvation of the Roman People. 